Liberty, New Jersey, the East Coast Mecca of the boxing world. And yet it was 62 years ago that Jack Dempsey and Georges Carpentier squared off in the last heavyweight championship scene in the Garden State. But tonight, live from Harris Marina Hotel Casino, the heavyweight title is back and on the line again as the undefeated WBC champion Larry Holmes meets the challenge of New Jersey's own Scott Frank. Tonight's NBC Sports Special is brought to you by Old Milwaukee and Old Milwaukee Light. It doesn't get any better than this. By Commodore Computer in more homes than any other home computer. By the 1983 Volkswagen. Nothing else is a Volkswagen. And by Lava. Lava with clean scrubbing. Plumus gets extra dirty hands clean. A crowd of 6,000 is on hand, and we're located inside a tent alongside Harris Marina Hotel and Casino. And we welcome you. Hi, everybody. I'm Marv Albert, and we welcome you to a night of boxing. A night of boxing that features Larry Holmes defending his WBC Heavyweight Championship for a 16th time. And to get it all going, we have the number one ranked junior welterweight, Steve Herron. A man in line for a title shot going up against California Luffy Aquino. He's 21 and 1, 15 by knockout. And then Larry Holmes and Scott Frank. Frank is 20 and 0, but the quality of his opponent list is questionable. A subject that we'll be addressing later on during the course of the telecast. And as always, I'm joined at ringside by the fight doctor, Ferdy Pacheco, who is wondering about the 223 pounds that Larry Holmes is carrying coming in the heaviest of his career. He took the scales 223 yesterday. Is he taking Scott Frank lightly? He might be taking him heavily. You know, that's a problem with heavyweights. As they get older, if they take the weight off to look cosmetically like they did before, they leave it in the gym. But if they come in too heavy, they've got to carry it around, as Holmes has to do tonight. It's better to do what Eddie Futch says. Train until you get in shape and forget about what the weight is. Will we be seeing another Lucian Rodriguez, Randall Texcom performance against Larry Holmes? I don't think so, because Scott Frank is a wacky type of fighter. It comes in throwing punches from all sides. The other two guys fought strange defensive fights. Uh, Rodriguez fought a purely defensive fight just to stay alive, and um, Tex Cobb actually came forward in a defensive fight with his face. All right, there has been much media criticism of tonight's matchup pitting Larry Holmes and Scott Frank, so we thought we'd check out a cross-section of that opinion. I think it's a sad state of affairs where a man without a last name can fight for a heavyweight championship. I think that Scott Frank should fight Ann Margaret for possession of a last name. It's a, it, it's a bad match. He's, he's going to be very badly overmatched. It, 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 it might be something like the, uh, the takes Cobb fight. It's no worse than uh, Ali Dunn. It's no worse than Ali Evangelista. It's no worse than Holmes Rodriguez. It's no worse than Frazier, Terry Daniels. I mean, you can't call a mismatch a mismatch until it happens. Whether Holmes has lost it or not is a question, but I don't think we'll find out against a fighter of the caliber of Scott Frank. When a 200-pound man hits another 200-pound man, anything can happen. But it would be uh, Frank's uh, chances of strictly puncher's luck in this, in this fight. I mean, if they, if they only scheduled fights that were going to be good ones, there'd be a heavyweight championship fight once every two years. I think NBC made a mistake. They could have put Scott Frank against me for three rounds, the winner to fight Larry Holmes, and there's still a question whether Scott Frank would have fought Larry Holmes tonight. Well, Bert Sugar, the editor of Ring Magazine, can seem to make up his mind about uh, tonight's fight. Scott Frank have any shot at all? Well, it'll be a shock if he wins. However, you know, that's why we're all watching tonight. Because when two big men get in the ring, you just never know what's going to happen. All right, Scott Frank, Larry Holmes coming up later on. We'll be back with Steve Heron and Lupe Aquino in just a moment. City, New Jersey on a hot and humid night. We're getting set for junior welterweight matchup. Steve Heron going against Lupe Aquino. For the ring introductions, let's go to Ed Daring. Ladies and gentlemen, this next bout is scheduled for 10 rounds and it's in the junior welterweight division. 
The judges, Lawrence Wallace, Charles Spina, and Rudy Battle. The timekeeper to Bell is Roy Johnson. Counting for the knockdown seconds, alternate referee Frank Cappuccino. In the ring at this time, the man in charge of the scheduled 10 round junior welterweight bout, referee Zach Clayton. And now, boxing fans, introducing the principals. First, in the blue corner, wearing the blue trunks with the white lettering. He tipped in at an even 149 pounds. This gentleman has 21 wins, one loss with 15 knockouts. He is a native of Tijuana, Mexico, and now residing in Santa Pola, California. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Lupe Aquino. Aquino. And his opponent in the red corner. He too is wearing the all blue trunks. He weighed in at an even 147 pounds. This young man has a record of 24 wins, two losses with 18 knockouts. All the way from Houston, Texas. Boxing fans, here is Steve Heron. Heron. And the referee, Zach Clayton, bringing Heron and Aquino together. That's good. Now, all of this is your fight. I'm going to let you men fight your fight. If you're fighting, must abide by the rules of the state. I'm going to let you men fight on the inside as long as both hands are free. And I command you guys to break. I want you to step back and resume fighting. And pulling out of that clinch, I want you to protect yourselves. In the event of a knockdown, the man scoring that knockdown must go to the furthest corner. Remain as we throw resume fighting. If you come out beforehand, I'm going to send you back. And probably getting knocked down, must take an eight-second count. Kneeling or standing, it makes no difference. Three knockdowns will not terminate this fight. I'll use my discretion in that regard. And you guys shake hands now. Come out to fight in the bell. Good luck both of you. Any and here are the state of New Jersey scoring on the round system. As uh, you look at the uh, tail of the tape, and an even matchup. Heron at 28 years of age. Aquino, 20 years old. Steve Heron in line to fight the WBC junior welterweight champion, Bruce Curry, in a mandatory title defense. Scheduled for February. In fact, Heron's biggest win was a seventh round knockout earlier in his career of Curry. And Heron running right out to meet up with Lupe Aquino. According to his manager, Aquino's record at 21 and 1, 15 by knockout. His last bout, his best bout against Victor Abraham. Came up with a seventh round knockout. Abraham at one time, Sugar Ray Leonard's sparring partner. Aaron's last fight, last May, stopped Juan Contreras in the third round. Steve Harris says he's had difficulty getting fights. The people are ducking him. He's right there. He's too good in a division that was weak for a while. Now he's heating up with the presence of Johnny Bumpus and, uh, of course, those champions, Curry. Everyone else is just lining up for Curry. Now, that's why these fights are so important for Steve Aaron. He must fight. He must look good. He's in, in position for mandatory. Should he trip one of these nights, it's bye-bye title shot. This is scheduled for 10. Round one action. Steve Heron at 24 and 2. 18 by knockout. His two losses stopped by Milt McCrory fighting as a welterweight. That was back in June of 81. On the undercard of Sugar Ray Leonard and Ayu Kalule. Since then, he's won 13 in a row at 10 by knockout. And the other loss, a 10 round decision to Armando Ramirez in Honolulu. That just before the uh, McCrory fight, so he has come on since then. Aaron began his professional boxing career late at age 25, never fought as an amateur. Has talent, strictly a boxer, good stamina, can take a punch. Aquino not showing a great deal of fear right now. He's just uh, going right to him. A feeling out round, not a great deal of excitement, but Lupe certainly not backing away from Steve Heron. Steve Heron has uh, sometimes put that glove across his uh, face like uh, Norton used to do and like Timmy Witherspoon did with such success against Holmes in his last uh, title defense. 
Aquino on the attack. Steve Heron said he would go through a feeling out first round, as you said. He has never seen Aquino. Boogie conditions inside a tent located alongside the Paris Marina Hotel and Casino in Atlantic City. And the crowd, as you can tell, subdued at this point. They are here for the uh, title fight, which will be coming up later on between Larry Holmes and Scott Frank. And Scott Frank back in his dressing room and getting ready. That bout will get underway in less than an hour here on NBC. Well, Scott, <laughs> resting up, getting ready. Less than nervous, wouldn't you say? What is he doing? At, uh, obviously, I know what he's doing, but I think what, what I, I what I think he's doing right now is computing the uh, tax on three hundred and fifty thousand dollars and figuring out what kind of a, a tax shelter he can get to avoid yeah. the tax. Look at the chin. You can see the raw spot in the chin, where the stitches were just taken out a few days ago. It should not be a factor in this fight. Although I would be surprised if it doesn't open. It's a very small cut, but it's at the spot where you get hit a lot, right on the tip of the chin. Uppercuts will open that. Back in the ring where he gets set for round two. Junior welterweight bout. Steve Heron ranked first by the WBC, number seven by the WBA. He's on the right going against Lupe Aquino. I got the feeling that first round he was just being reined in. Look at the way they're going at him. Aquino standing and slugging. Aquino showing no respect whatsoever, stood his ground, and even backed up Steve Heron. <clears throat> I got that feeling that first round was just Braverman saying, feel it out, get, get warm, get ready to go. He's got in his corner the great old-timer Braverman. Every corner should have a Braverman at least once in their life. It's an experience. That's Al Braverman of the corner of Steve Heron. And from time to time, we may hear Al from uh, his corner position. Lupe Aquino, Al living in Santa Paula, California, from Tijuana, Mexico. Aquino ready to lay it out with uh, Steve Heron, showing no re respect, no regard for his punching power. Could be a mistake because Steve can punch. Uh-oh. And Zach Clayton unhappy because uh, Heron unloaded on the clinch. Heron was wrong there. He punched in the, on the break. Trying too hard. Steve Heron at this point is trying too hard. Fighting a calm, controlled fight. Lupe Aquino was successful in discombobulating him. He is not fighting a calm, cold fight. He's trying to punch it out and look great. And not doing so consequently. We just saw what could be the key to the fight. A good, stiff jab. Followed up by the right hand. But here is Aquino back. With the combination, and Aquino landed with the right hand. What guts on Aquino. He is standing right there, not intimidated in the least, and got the better of the exchange. Lope Aquino's only loss to Rudy Hernandez last April at the Forum at Inglewood, California. Aquino said he hurt his hand in the second round, and, and the judge uh, took points away for low blows. Nothing wrong with Aquino's hands today. Zach Clayton trying to control Steve, who's a little bit desperate here. And we approach 10 seconds left in the second round. Marv Albert with the fight doctor, Bernie Pacheco. And we're final seconds of the round. Scott Frank between rounds earlier. Larry Holmes getting set back in his dressing room. 
interesting line from Lara the other day. He says he's puzzled by the fact that the people who say he lost it are the same people who used to say he never had it. <laughs> Great line. Oh, hi, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Even the heavyweight champion in the world has a mom. <laughs> Something our cameraman said. Every time. Walked out of the room. Huh? Somebody sneezed right. twice and he left. left. I would, you didn't Listen to Braverman. Right the kidney I want. Wang it into him this time. You understand? Take the time. And we move on to round three. What does the fight doctor scorecard show? I have it even. I have an even fight. That's Steve Heron on the left. And Lupe Aquino on the right. Heron out of New York City. Now living in Houston, Texas. Good uppercut by Heron. Good inside uppercut. About. Now, he continues to punch while Zach Clayton's trying to break him up. Zach is not going to like that if that continues. And again, the good exchange. Zach Clayton, usually a referee who likes to see the boxers punch out of the difficulty of the corner, but I have a feeling he's going to take a more aggressive role. He's going to have to because Heron's really wound up tight. He wants to look good. He's trying his best for a quick knockout. Lupe is not cooperating. And a minute gone by, third round. A warning from Clayton. Watch the buddy. seems to be much stronger than uh, Lupe Aquino, but Aquino just will not um, concede. He's in there punching, not as hard, but many times he's landing three or four punches to one. And scoring here. Lupe Aquino, 20 years old, from Tijuana, Mexico. Aquino making a mistake of letting uh, Steve Heron get him on the ropes when he should be fighting his motion fight. There he goes. We mentioned earlier that Heron has had difficulty getting opponents. Aquino was a late substitute. People just do not want to fight Steve Heron. They went through four different names that had accepted fights and fell out before they got to uh, Lupe Aquino. Aquino should get out of that corner. He's beginning to get hurt by Steve Heron, who punches him much heavier than Lupe Aquino. And a good action. Third round. I'll take it out. So final seconds of the round. We'll be back in a moment. It is round four. It's in good action. Lupe Aquino on the right. Steve Harris far side of the ring. And Aquino continues to unload treating punches from Harris. Harris seems to have a cut over one eye. I said, hey, come on. I said, hey, come on. Come on. Disaster. Now that will change his strategy. I'll take it to tie it up. Get out of there. Al Braverman saying, stay on top of him. You're not on top of him. Well, he got on top of him and he got himself a nice little cut. And remember, Aaron in line for a mandatory title defense against the WBC junior welterweight champion Bruce Curry. And did not expect this kind of test. Aquino just got butted just then. 
Look, look at Aquino's the, the look of disdain on his face. He sees the cut, and he's now saying, oh, boy, things are now coming my way. Oh, no grappling holding. No grappling holding. Free Clayton says, work it out by yourself. Heron going in, covering up, protecting the eye, and then trying to unload with the combination. Also going in with his head. Look at the smile on Aquino's face. That's a mistake. He's taking the first part of the round. He can keep on going and even up this fight. He's... to rest. He's going to keep right on top of him. I'll punch him two or three punches to one. And again, a punch on the break thrown by Heron. And Aquino getting very confident. Aquino just almost playing, almost having fun here. Whereas Steve Heron is beginning to look desperate. Combination again by Aquino, but Heron right back, and he stunned Aquino with an uppercut. And Heron will require repairs in the corner between rounds. Uh, he's got a good man. Braverman can stop a uh, cut that looks like a dam broke. Blood all over the face of Lupe Aquino, but it's the blood of Steve Heron. So the end of the round. Round four scheduled for ten. Larry Holmes getting set to go against Scott Frank about 40 minutes from now. We mentioned earlier that uh, Larry Holmes came in heavy, weighing in at 223 yesterday. We asked him about it. I don't think it will affect my stamina. I don't feel that it will affect my speed. I think it will make me stronger and to show the people that I'll be strong. I'm knocking Scott Frank out for two of us in. Well, Larry Holmes came in at 2.22 for the bout against Lucian Rodriguez. And people said that he was disinterested, thought he'd have no problem with Rodriguez. And there are many who feel the same way with uh, Larry coming in at 2.23. That's uh, 10 pounds more than he weighed against Tim Witherspoon. That's certainly going to be a factor. Now let's take a look at Heron's eye. Looks like it's been patched up well. And on to round five. Certainly didn't think he was going to run into a buzzsaw like this. There's the eye. You can see the blood streaming down. It got all over him. It got all over his opponent. And it's not a particularly bad cut to stop, but uh, we're only in the fifth round. That could open much, much bigger. What does the fight doctor scorecard show? I have it even. That punches to the back of the head. That punch was during a uh, break. I'm surprised that Zach has not gotten a little hostile about that. Yes, he is out of the take charge school, and uh, he's getting angry. There's a lot of putting going on, and there's a lot of holding behind the head. Both fighters are uh, particularly uh, tough with their heads. You can't find guilt in one above the other because they're both doing it. That's Steve Heron on the near side. Boy, Steve Heron is in a dog fight. Nothing easy for Steve Heron tonight. And I think he's had a few dog fights, and that he's from a family of 14, 10 boys and four girls. Steve, number 12 out of the 14. Most of his family living in the New York area. Steve now living in Houston, Texas. No wonder he's such a great fighter. Again, the punching during the break, and there's the blood coming down the left eyebrow of Steve Heron. The blood is now all over Zach Clayton. It, it is beginning to flow, and the cut is opening again and much larger. It is a factor in this fight. It will be a factor in this fight. And now he goes over to the doctor. It will be a factor in this fight. What a tragedy. Zach Clayton has called it. He's called his fight, I 
don't believe it. A very quick call by Clayton. I don't believe it. A major upset pulled off by Lupe Aquino. What a shock. Crowd reacting against it. Now, usually what the referee check it out with the ringside position. I, that's what I thought he was doing. I thought he was taking uh, the fighter over to be checked by the um, uh, doctor because we've seen much worse cuts and uh, Braverman happens to be one of the great cut men uh, of this last two or three decades. Although the referee in the state of New Jersey can't call the fight. Let's see. It appeared that he called it. They Lupe, may, he may not have called it. Lupe Aquino did celebrate. Let's see if it was uh, premature. The discussion continues in the corner. Well, I mean, uh, this is highly unusual. You don't have chance to do minor surgery. I mean, either it is or it isn't called. I mean, you don't have that much time to uh, examine and do a cut, but they're giving him all the time in the world. And apparently uh, the scorecard's being collected. It is. Uh, it has been called. Well, uh, if it isn't, then Ed Darian's going to be a referee because I, he shouldn't be in the ring unless the fight's over with. All right, it is all over. And we'll hear the official announcement. And once again, funny things happen on the way to the championship. That's why you can never say anything is sure in boxing. Steve Heron in line for a title shot against the WBC junior welterweight champ Bruce Curry. Here's the announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, due to the severe cut sustained to principal Steve Heron, referee Zach Clayton stops this bout at 1 minute and 52 seconds of the fifth round. So 152 of round five, the bout stopped by the referee, Zach Clayton, and it's a major upset. Lupe Aquino winning over Steve Heron. Here in Atlantic City, New Jersey, on the undercard of Larry Holmes, Scott Frank, junior welterweight Steve Heron, who's ranked first by the WBC and in line for a title shot against Bruce Curry in February was stopped on cuts by Lupe Aquino. Tomorrow, a big day of football on NBC, starting with NFL 83 at 12.30 to take a close-up look at the day of football. Let's switch to Len Berman, the host of NFL 83. It was throw for five touchdowns against Houston last week. Meanwhile, in Cincinnati... Up tomorrow at NBC and coming up in about 35 minutes, Larry Holmes and Scott Frank. And just immediately ahead on the undercard, an interesting bout between junior middleweights Fred Hutchings and Kirkman Lang. I refinished this prospect out of Stockton, California. Fred Hutchings went up against veteran Kirkland Lang, the man who upset Roberto Duran a year ago, back last September. Let's pick up their bout in round nine. Mickey Duff putting on a show in the corner of uh, Kirkland Lang. Now screaming at Lang, you gave that last round away. This after the uh, good performance in the previous round. This is round nine, scheduled for ten. Junior Middleweights, Kirkman Lang in the maroon trunks, and Fred Hutchings in the white. Mickey Duff fighting a better fight in the corner than his fighters fighting inside the ring. Although, if you know Mickey Duff and his combative spirit, you know it's hard to take two losses in a row. Last night, the um, wonderful Boza Edwards, who always gives you 100%, got beat in a wonderful fight with Rocky Lockridge on the uh, Arguello Friar uh, epic. Hutchings chasing Lang. That right hand has been landing all the time. Bouncing off his chin. Look at how he holds his hands down. Kirkland Lang has not learned a lesson. And again, Hutchings able to snap the jab. He snaps his head back with regularity every round. It's amazing he didn't have a whiplash by the time he gets through with this. Lang 
a very difficult fighter to solve. Quickness of touching, height differential. Well, you see why he has difficulty finding work. He didn't fight for a year. Who would want to put his fighter in with Kirkland Lang? Who would want to? Nice right hand by Hutchings. You're going to get to... Oh, what a hook by Hutchings. High on the forehand, though. Lang taking a tattooing does not seem to have a clue as to how to fight back. Another good scoring round for Fred Hutchings out of Stockton, California. You know, you, you don't think that uh, factors come into a fighter's career. The fact that he's out of Stockton, California, and not out of New Jersey or New York, has stopped his career. You can't go out there to, to do a fight. They don't seem to be able to get good fights. And therefore, you have a terrific talent like this, and you can't get him to big fights. If he lived around uh, New Jersey, New York area, he'd be fighting every two months. And that is why there have been many who have moved to the uh, Jersey area. The Hutchings has fought on several occasions in Las Vegas. Now, and we are live in the dressing room of WBC heavyweight champion Larry Holmes getting sent to defend for the 16th time. Coming up, Scott Frank here in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And that is about a half hour away here on NBC. Let's go to the tenth and final round. Junior middleweights Kirkland Lang, Fred Hutchins. Tenth and final round. It's been all Fred Hutchings. He's in the white. Kirkland Lang in the maroon. Lang out of London, England, has taken a pasting. He's been the aggressor from time to time, but it's been all Hutchings. Tremendous right hand by Hutchins to open the 10th round. Oh, good left hook. And Lang in trouble for the first time. He buckled, but it appeared to be on his way down. He's holding on. Even look at the referee. Look at the way he's trying to pry him apart. And we're very early. Tapped round. Lang is trying to shake himself loose as Hutchings looks to finish him off. Good right hand by Hutchings. Here's Hutchings putting Lang down. Oh, oh, he went down hard. He hit his, oh, he hit his head on the canvas. He hit his head so hard on that canvas. I hope to have a batting. Here comes the doctor. Here comes the doctor immediately. That was too hard. Too hard a hit on the head. Very quick call by the referee, Cappuccino, and the ringside positions in to check it out. Kirkland Lang went down and hit his head. You can hear the impact as Hutchings buckled Lang early in the round, and that took him out as Lang trying to hold on. That's one of the most dangerous type of knockouts. It's not that the punch hurts you. It's that the back of the head hits the unpadded area, and that was heard all the way across the ring here at our broadcast position, and immediately the New Jersey doctors were right on top of him. They did not even wait to see the count. Dr. Daggett was right through the ropes. It's odd that this marks the first time that New Jersey uses a very heavily padded bottom rope. The fourth rope is very heavily padded. And uh, was pointed out to me today by the commissioner, said that's one of the things when they fall, they hit that bottom strand. And I've always been a big exponent of padding the outside of the ring a lot because the head falls into the outside of the uh, ring. Doctor looking at checking the reflexes. Dr. Daggett checking the reflexes of the eye. The uh, fighter's apparently talking to Daggett, moving his legs. Reflexes are being tested by a, a neurological hammer. One doctor's working on the extremities. The other doctor working uh, on the head. 
The most important thing is to keep a boxer down, not to let him get up in a hurry. There's no point in getting up until the doctor certifies that he's good, that nothing's wrong, and then let him get up by stages. First to sit down at the, at the uh, stool, which is already there and ready for him, should Daggett let him get up. Dr. Daggett. Herkel Lang talking to the physicians. That's a good sign. Moving his glove around. Now just getting up. Going to sit down in the stool first. And Marvin, I must commend the New Jersey Athletic Commission. The way they handled that was perfection. They jumped in before the referee even had a chance to say anything and were right on the duck. All right, a look now at how Fred Hutchings entered this bout. A big hit by Hutchings, a left hand that buckled Lang. This is early portion, round 10. First time that Lang was hurt, and Lang trying to regroup, went for the clinch. Now, later on, seconds later in the round, here's the big right hand by Hutchings. Lang trying to hold on. Out it goes, and there's the head making contact with the canvas. He was down for several minutes. The ringside physicians able to get in, and uh, Kirkland Lang looks to be all right. Yeah, Mickey Dove just came over here making signals, and he's okay. He's shaking up, but he was okay. He looks fine and clear now. So fortunately, Lang is all right. There's Freddie Hutchings with another impressive performance. TKO, round 10. So Hutchings now, record of 23 at 1, 16 by knockout. And back live in Atlantic City. We'll be back in just a moment to talk with Muhammad Ali. For the first, atmosphere's heavy, world title lays on the line. Strong and proud, he is much older. I'm the faster, I'm in my prime. Third round late, he starts to tire. Open cut over his left eye. Smell and blood, attack is relentless. In the box seats, I see his girl cry. No mercy, no quarter, no place to hide from me or the man. Right and wrong, never can order. No mercy, take it while you can now. No mercy, take His eyes are flooded, God, he can't even see. I've hunted this tile, but now it don't seem right. I fight back tears while I destroy his life.
Jersey, Marv Albert with the fight, Dr. Ferdy Pacheco, and we are closing in on Larry Holmes and Scott Frank. And for Scott Frank, his fee tonight of $350,000, easily the biggest payday of his boxing life. So for Scott Frank, it's a long way from his days of club fighting around the state of New Jersey. Frank's first year as a pro, 1978, saw him win by decision over veteran Chuck Webner, a man who also fought for the title in similar circumstances to that of tonight. March of 1982, Scott Frank and Ronaldo Snipes fought that bizarre draw that had its comical moments. In Scott's last bout in July, he won by decision over Ken Arles, but not an impressive performance. Scott, are you bothered by people poking at you about the fact that you have this title shot? Well, I, no, nobody's really been poking at me, so uh, not at all. In, in terms of uh, the fact that people could look at your record and say, yes, he's undefeated, but aside from Ronaldo Snipes, where are the other quality opponents? And yet here you have quickly uh, moved to a point where you're fighting for the heavyweight title. Well, let me put it this way. Uh, if you look at my record, let, let, let's look at them all. Jerry Cooney, Tex Cobb. I mean, I, I fought a better opponent than they did. Scott, are you bothered by the fact that many people don't take this fight seriously? Well... I could give you a couple of reactions, but we're on camera, you know. So. Something that can be used, yes. <laughs> well, well, it doesn't matter to me. And after the fight, you know, the people, you know, they, they're just whatever they say. It's opinions, you know. <laughs> so, you know, and everybody has an opinion. And everybody got something else, too, you know, but it doesn't mean nothing. Now, you were cut in training about a week and a half ago. Do you think Holmes might go for that cut, try to get you bleeding early in the bout? I no problem with that. He could, he could try. That means he. That means he has to change his style of fighting and start bringing up uppercuts. Now, now in a way, I'm doing a, a favor. I'm I'm screwing up his style of mostly jabbing right hands. Now he has to start working an uppercut, and he's going to do things he's not been used to doing. Is there a, a fear of being embarrassed in the ring? Well, I'll be honest with you. I I have approached most of my opponents all the same thing. I'm fighting. See, when you people look at the fight, you're looking at Harry Holmes, a heavyweight champ. You know, he, he has this, he has that. I, I, I'm, I'm in reality. I know what it is. He's fighting. He got a couple of good breaks. He's a good boxer. And that's what I'm fighting. A guy with a good left hand and a good right. That's all I'm fighting. You people are the ones that project this, this mighty man. I fought, I fought one time and I got my jaw broken in the second round. Ninth round, I knocked the guy out. I fought seven rounds with a broken jaw. It was nothing. I'll be honest, it was nothing. You know? Scott Frank trying to give the impression it's just another fight that is uh, upcoming. Atlantic City, New Jersey. There's Barbers Frazier on the right and his dad, pretty fair fighter, fellow by the name of Joe Frazier. Larry Holmes slated to go against Barbers in November. Right now, though, let's go to NBC News in New York. Atlantic City, New Jersey. Larry Holmes getting the gloves on in his dressing room. As we near fight time, Holmes and Scott Frank upcoming in a circus-like tent that is alongside Harris Marina Hotel Casino. And we are just moments away from fight time. Let's take a look at the career of Larry Holmes, a career that began in 1973, a career that has produced a record of 43 and 0. Larry Holmes won the WBC heavyweight title in June of 1978 by outslugging Ken Norton. Holmes taking a 15-round decision in Las Vegas. After successfully defending by knockout eight straight times, Larry had some adventures. November of 81, stunned by Ronaldo Snipes, taken down in round seven. But Holmes was able to recoup and rally to stop Snipes in the 11th. Although Snipes felt the bout should not have been stopped. June of 82, the well-publicized heated matchup with Jerry Cooney. And for Larry Holmes, a high point in his career. Cooney stopped in the 13th. A sweet victory for the champion. November 
1982. Holmes threw the shutout against Randy Tex Cobb. A fight that went 15 rounds. March of this year, Scranton, Pennsylvania. Another easy victory for Holmes, but not able to knock out the lightly regarded Lucian Rodriguez, so it went the distance. And then this past May in Las Vegas, the remedy who felt the champion got the benefit of the doubt against Tim Witherspoon, bringing us to this evening. Larry, you've trained about four weeks for this fight. You think that's enough for a heavyweight championship fight, or is it that you're taking Scott Frank a little cheap? Well, I'm not taking him cheap. Is that uh, I've been training, I've been in training, and uh, I got four good weeks of training. That's the point. Will the cut that they talk so much about when Scott Frank under his chin, will that be a factor? I don't think so because it's not running down in his eye and it won't blur the vision. So I don't think that cut will be a factor unless it really opens up to be a real good cut. But I'm not even going to concentrate on that. I'm concentrating on taking him out of there as soon as I can. Larry, are you looking past Scott Frank to the fight in November with Marvis Fraser? No, I don't look past anybody. I like to take one step at a time. And I, and I don't care what the critics say or the people say out there. Uh, this guy is a serious opponent. He's going to come out there to try to take my head off. He's, this is an opportunity of a lifetime. And this guy's going to be serious. And this is why I train very hard for this fight. I'm not taking no fight lightly. I learned my lesson when I did that before. Larry, the fighter is the last to know when to get off stage. You think you're the man you were three or four years ago. You're getting hit more. It means your reflexes are not what they used to be. You can't put people away. Your strength isn't what it used to be. Do you find that you're not the fighter you were a few years ago? No, that don't indicate to me that I'm coming to the end of, end of my road. It's just that fighters have changed styles and whatnot. They study a little bit more. And I probably wasn't in the top shape as I would normally be. Uh, and, and we all... Uh, slow down, you know, with age and whatnot. But I felt that with my slowing down, I'm much smarter boxer now. I don't used to, I used to do a lot of lateral movement and whatnot. Now I stand flat. And once you stand flat, you're vulnerable to punches. You, you say you're a smarter fighter. You think you're smart enough to do what everybody else hasn't been able to do, get off stage oh, in time? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know. I know I'm smarter than that because I seen and I sat back and took notes on what happened to other fighters when they try to prove themselves that they can be something that they're really not. One thing we cannot be in that father time, and I feel that when that time comes for me, I feel that I have enough people around me, good people around me, like Eddie Futch and Keith Clever, my doctor. But matter of fact, besides all that, I have myself, my family. To say, hey, Larry, that's enough. I can't keep going on like this. And besides, Freddie, I got in this game for money, and I made money. So I'm just doing it now to do it for the rest of the year, and then we're going to think about what we're going to do next year. Getting set to defend his heavyweight title for the 16th time. Coming off the controversial 12-round split decision over Tim Witherspoon back in May in Las Vegas. And Scott Frank making his way toward the ring here in Atlantic City. Scott Frank, 25 years old, from Passaic, New Jersey, now living in Oakland, New Jersey. With a family of seven of 20 and 0, one draw, 14 by knockout. His last fight, July 14th, 10th round decision over Ken Arm. But an unimpressive victory for Frank. Looked sluggish as he did in his previous fight against Steve Zowski. Uh, last January, also a 10 round decision for Frank. Really his most noteworthy bout, a bout that we televised on NBC, a, a 10 round draw against Ronaldo Snipes. Also, controversial decision back in March of 82. Fight that had several comical moments, as we mentioned earlier. So the quality of his opponents can certainly be questioned. Here he is fighting for the heavyweight championship. Uh, it gives you some idea of the thinness of the heavyweights when this man is ranked number 10 and he's uh, undefeated. A man that's ranked number 10 by the WBC and undefeated naturally is in line for a title shot. But um, when you look at the list of the WBC, seven of the top ten lost in the last two or three months. So it's uh, uh, the, the heavyweights are really thin at this point. I believe also the fact that we have a double championship going with Dokes in one division and uh, Holmes in the other eating up challengers twice as fast has something to do with that also. In the meantime, he has come in virtually silent here. Scott Frank has come in, and if his relatives are here, they certainly haven't made themselves known because he snuck in. 
Scott, incidentally, not a fan of the rigors of training. In fact, he retired for a while following disagreements with manager Lou Duva. They did part for a period of time. Duva is back in his corner, but uh, the feeling is that may not last very long. And he's also a press agent's nightmare because for some reason he decided not to give interviews this time, not to talk, and uh, came to this fight virtually unheralded by um, virtue of his silence. Scott Frank actually called Larry Holmes to pitch himself for a title shot, and Holmes went for it. Larry jokingly said, it's the first time anyone ever called me to get beat up. <laughs> that remains to be seen. The music's up, it's cued, and now comes the entrance of the champion, Larry Holmes. This is outside the uh, tent structure alongside the uh, Harris Marina Hotel and Casino. And Larry Holmes from the uh, prefabricated structure making his way toward the tent. fight is brought to you by the 1983 Volkswagens. Nothing else is a Volkswagen. By Schlitz Malt Liquor. No one does it like the bull. By Commodore Computer in more homes than any other home computer. And by Sure, Sure Antiperspirant in three convenient forms. They'll keep you dry all day. Larry Holmes and Scott Frank now awaiting the official introductions. And we're set, so let's go to Ed Darian in the ring. Ladies and gentlemen, Murad Muhammad Incorporated and Bob Andrioli Productions proudly present the scheduled 15 round World Boxing Council Heavyweight Championship bout. In the ring at this time, the man in charge of the scheduled 15-round title bout, referee Tony Perez of New York. And now, boxing fans, introducing the principals. First, in the blue corner, wearing the light blue trunks with the red and blue trim, he weighed in at 211 and one quarter pounds. This young man is undefeated. In 21 professional bouts with one draw and 14 knockouts, he is ranked 10th by the World Boxing Council and is currently the New Jersey State Heavyweight Champion from Oakland, New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, the challenger, Scott Frank. the white trunks with the red trim, he tipped in at an even 223 pounds. This young man is undefeated in 43 professional bouts with 30 knockouts. From eastern Pennsylvania, defending his title for the 16th time, the World Boxing Council heavyweight champion. Scheduled for 12 rounds, 12 
Rounds. So the correction made by the ring announcer, Ed Darien, who originally uh, reported a 15-round schedule foul, but it is scheduled for 12. Right, no question. Check and the referee, Tony Perez. Quick check of the tail of the tape. We mentioned the Holmes weight, heaviest of his career, 223. Frank Cup coming in at 211 and a quarter. Scott Frank does have decent power, but the question, can he get to home? He is an effective body puncher, but the man has not been in with anyone with the uh, credentials of a top-ranked heavyweight. So we're underway in round one. Frank figures to come out and try his stuff while he's got a chance. Larry wants to put him away as soon as he can. He doesn't want to risk stick around. This is a night of upsets. What with upsets here? There are many who have felt that Scott Frank's only chance would be to try and get Holmes involved in a street-like brawl. But Holmes said that won't matter. Holmes got a lot of fat around the midsection. It would be hard to carry that for uh, 12 rounds. Of course, Larry says it just makes him stronger. Larry Holmes went at his prime very, very smooth with that excellent left jab, followed up usually by the short right cross. Not a devastating puncher, but has that good knockout record. And always piles up points with the jab. Larry looking to sucker. Scott Frank with that right hand, as soon as he comes in, he triggers it off. He missed him the first two times he's thrown it. If it lands flush on the chin, could be tough for Mr. Scott. And there are some boxing people who felt that Holmes did not properly train for tonight's fight because he has no fear of Scott Frank. So similar to the situation against Lucian Rodriguez, there's a question concerning Holmes' concentration. But does it matter? We'll soon see. Holmes' jab is starting to find its mark. Early in a fight, Holmes dominates with his jab. And for less than a minute left, in this first round, oh! telling blow of this first round. That's what he was looking to do, sucker that right hand, and he's loading it up again. There it went. There it went again. Nailing Scott Frank. Connecting through the gloves of Frank. Frank's waiting too long. Frank's got to fight. He's got to be throwing things or else he is going to get cleaned up. So Larry Holmes doing whatever he has wanted to do in this opening round using that jab very effectively. Ooh. Out for round two to meet up with Scott Frank who was told in his corner you have to throw more than one punch. He must throw in bunches or else Larry will pick him apart with that right hand. It was a good opening round for the champion whose brisk jab is doing its job as it usually does. Larry looking to drop that right hand and finish the fight as early as he can. Look at the fierceness of that jab. Larry Holmes getting in with that jab right from the opening bell. And they make contact under the chin of Frank, and he does cut easily. He's coming off that cut sustained during training camp, which raised several questions. Well, as Scott Frank said in the uh, interview, it doesn't make any difference to him whether it's cut. And Larry Holmes said, I'm not aiming for it. I just want to knock him out fast. It looks like that's what Holmes wants to do. He doesn't care about the cut. Good right hand by Holmes. Looking much more aggressive than he did against Lucian Rodriguez. Of course, Frank providing more of a, an inviting target than Rodriguez. Well, he's standing still. And if he doesn't come in punching two and three, he's just going to get picked apart. His chance is a street fight, and he's certainly not going to get it sitting around waiting for the punches to land. No 
sign of any intent of getting involved in that type of brawl by Frank. Midway point, round two, scheduled for 12. And it's been target practice for Holmes. said don't wait for him punch two and three times scott has not done that he's got to come in not only behind the jab but throwing the right hand and a hook after frank is lunging with his left but no shot of getting any impact at all and a great shot of getting hit with a counter right hand which larry is beginning to measure him with again Less than a minute left, round two. It's been a cover-up round for Scott Frank. Larry is sweating profusely. The heat is uh, rather unbearable under these lights. First two rounds have been brisk, good rounds for Larry Holmes. to 10 seconds left. In the second round, crowd responding because Frank did connect with a right hand. But Holmes not bothered by it. The German engineers who built the Volkswagen Scirocco were obsessed with aerodynamics. Of course, most of those 12 knockouts were earlier in his career. That has not been the case in recent years. Two good right hands by Scott Frank. Landing on Larry Holmes in the final seconds of the second round. Scott Frank is starting to have a lot of trouble with a left eye that's beginning to close up. You can see it turning black and blue. It will be closed in about another round or so. Those jabs of uh, Holmes landing right on target. Ace Murata in the corner. Scott Frank has been putting that cold compress, that cold iron end swell on it. And I'm afraid it's too late for even end swell. That eye will be closed in about another round or so. Holmes doubling up with the left hand, then trying to connect with the right. His corner got excited, Scott Frank, because he landed two strong right hands at the end of the round, and it looked like that they had reached Holmes. Holmes countering off the left hand of Frank. Larry Holmes opened up by painting Scott Frank with the jab. Good right hand, and that rocked Frank. This is round minute gone by. Larry Holmes defending for the 16th time. Marv Albert with the fight jockey. Bernie Pacheco. we live from Atlantic City. Every time Frank gets close to landing, the crowd responds. Now Larry's in command of this fight up to now. No question about it. Good uppercut by Holmes. Nice Two right-hand combinations to the side and then the uppercut. Trickle of nose coming from the blood of Scott, uh, from the nose of uh, Scott Frank. You can see the eyes closing up. Although, for some reason, Larry Holmes has abandoned that stinging jab. And there it is back again, funneled by the right hand. Larry doing a very workmanlike job on Scott Frank. Wonder what thoughts are going through the mind of Marvis Frazier and Joe Frazier as they watch this workmanlike exhibition of the champion Larry Holmes. Marvis Frazier slated to face Holmes in November. And we approach 15 seconds left, round three. And there are the Frasers looking on. Final second, third round. Scott Frank as he comes out for round four. And there's a, a terrific absence in his corner. Uh, Lou Duba, who the great motivator and corner man who's supposed to work in his corner, has not come in. And we wonder uh, what significance that has. He's not being motivated in the corner. Good right hand by Larry Holmes. Oh, and the left hand following up. Larry White.
fighting to stop this fight right now. He wants to get his knockout. Keep in mind, Holmes has not put anyone down since he dropped Jerry Cooney, and that was back in round two. Cooney did not go down in that 13th and final round, so that's some 50 rounds of boxing through Cooney, Cobb, Rodriguez, and Witherspoon. So Holmes would love the knockdown. Holmes is going for that knockdown. He's got all the power of the old Holmes going. He's, he's as early in the fight, he's warmed up, and he is letting fly the old Larry Holmes power in that right hand. Looking to protect the left eye, has the glove up high. He should look to protect his entire body. He's getting creamed by Larry Holmes almost every round. Thus far, that cut, much advertised, that was going to open, did not, and several crunching uppercuts have hit there. Larry slowing down some, wanting to work the body so his hands will come down. No offense whatsoever on the part of Scott Frankheyer. That well-advertised attack, that street fight that he said he was going to get into has not materialized. Oh, the jab setting up the right, but Holmes not able to collect, connect that time. As we approach a minute remaining in the round. All Larry's trying to do there is get that arm down. He's holding it way up, as you pointed out, Marv, and he's trying to get it down by the attack to the flank. been a very quiet bout for the referee Tony Perez. His presence has not been needed. I have no idea what Scott Frank is waiting for because if he doesn't launch an attack pretty soon, he's just going to be beaten down. It's possible that he misses a Luduva in the corner telling him to get out there and go and do and die. Well, pretty reportedly, uh, Lou Duda had another falling out with uh, Frank. There have been a few of those in the career of Scott Frank. All right, we'll be back in 30 seconds, and we'll visit in the corner of Scott Frank, who is taking a hammering here at the end of the round, although Scott says he's all right. Use the jab coming in. Take a nice deep breath. Hold it in and then out. Come on. You gotta use the jab. Put some Vaseline in the nose, Tommy. Yeah. Well, Joe Fariello in the you corner of use the jab. Well, Scott Frank. Right capturing it when he said, Scott, you're doing nothing. Fariello goes back to the uh, custom auto days with a large heavyweight fighter by the name of Buster Mathis. This is round five. And at the end of round four, Holmes able to successfully unload on Frank. It looked like he was going to put him out. If he had enough time at the end of that round, he might have. The combinations were crisp. They were landing and jolting Scott Frank, although he tried uh, to make light of it. Make it look like he wasn't really getting hurt. It has been a shutout thus far for Holmes. Scoring on the 10-point ball. Oh, oh, good right hand by Holmes. Scott Frank says... It wasn't anything. This side of the pages of his bout against uh, Ronaldo Snipes, but he is getting loved. He's a better actor than he is a fighter. Holmes feels it. He feels his knockout is right there. As this is out of the pages of Tex Cobb now. Oh, look at that Holmes right hand. Was hit by the right hand of Frank, and now Frank is covering up. He can't give a standing eight, but he's counting it out. His eye is, he's been thumbed. He's talking about he's being thumbed. Scott Frank claiming he's thumbed. And Tony Perez says, okay, continue. But Frank covering up the eye. That's it. That's it, says Tony Perez. Oh, and Scott Frank does not agree. He's not claiming he was thumbed. standing eight, so he did not use it. Instead, he started a count, and 
And then when he saw that Frank was complaining about receiving the thumb of the eye, he did stop the count and then said continue. And now Perez has called it. So it is all over in round five. And Larry Holmes having his way from the opening bell with no problem at all. Throwing a blank at Scott Brown. of the bout. You see, Holmes has Frank trapped in the corner. There's a right hand that got Frank in the left eye. He'd been having problems with the eye from earlier in the fight. And now Frank looks to cover up. And right here he says he was thumped. And Perez stepped in, not allowing Holmes to unleash. Frank says I was thumped. Perez checks it out, starts the count. We'll get another look at this. And here's Frank trying to express the fact that he was thumped. First, the overhand right by Frank that missed. There's the punch by Holmes that got into the eye of Frank. As I said, Tony Perez could have utilized the standing eight, but he is one who says he does not believe in it. And so he did not go for it. So... That's the story here at Atlantic City. We'll be back to talk about it with the principals after we pause for these messages. We'll be right back. This is one again. City, New Jersey, Marv Albert with the fight doctor, Ferdy Pacheco. The official time, one minute, 28 seconds of round five. Larry Holmes stopping Scott Frank. And the champion is alongside Ferdy in the ring. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you, Doc. A knockout, which uh, you have been long looking for. Oh, yeah, well, I had a little bit to prove this time. You know, I only had four weeks of getting ready, but I got ready. Scott Frank deserved a shot. We gave him a shot. Strong, determined young man. If he stays at it, work at it, Freddie, you'll hear a lot more from him. Now, what do you think about his claim you uh, thumbed him? He went down with a thumb and he couldn't get up and uh, so forth. Well, you know, fighters always fight. And I excuse when a good punch land in the eye. I mean, from the first round, his eye was puffing, swollen, and, you know, he was he needed an excuse, and he got it, and he got on out. But, you know, that's boxing. You know, some guys can take it better than others, and some can. At the end of one of those rounds, he landed two crunching right hands. Did they bother you at all? Oh, he hit me high on the head. It, it shook me up just a second, but it didn't really hurt me. Like, it really hurt me, but uh, it shook me up a little bit. I knew I got hit. Do you think it was smart of you to let Marvis Frazier in here and watch this? Well, hey, Marvis Frazier still thinks he can whoop me and his father and his whole family. But let him keep thinking. You know what? I'm better all the time. I'm better with age. I'm smarter. I don't have to move as much. I serve, I serve my energy. And Marvin Frazier will get knocked out just the same way. And, and it's up to his father put him in there and our contracts are signed. We're ready to do it again so, on NBC. So we will see you in November. I'd like to say one more thing. I'd like to say hi to my mom and my kids. And hi to Don King. It's a knockout of a show, NBC. <laughs> Eddie Futch, the great, venerable trainer that's had so much to do with so many great fighters. How did you see your uh, charge this time? Well, uh, I saw him taking his time and keeping the fight under control all the way. Uh, uh, he, uh, set up, he set Frank up for the right hand with uh, a continual jab and the feint and the occasional left hook. And it was just a matter of time before uh, I thought that he would cut him down. Do you think this kid was ever in the in the fight at all? I mean, do you think Scott Frank was ever in this fight? Uh, he tried, but uh, uh, Larry had him under control at all times. Wouldn't you say that the difference in class is gigantic between the two fighters? Uh, well, that was a different, definite difference in class. Right. All right, Eddie, always a gentleman. Always glad to see you. We'll see you in November. Marvis Frazier uh, in November with uh, Larry Holmes for the title. Uh, we wait for him while we go back to Marv Albert at ringside. All right, Ferdy, this about... That ended at 128 of round five. I mentioned that the referee, Tony Perez, could have used the standing eight when Scott Frank complained that he was thumbed to the eye, but he chose not to. In fact, the standing eight has been a point of controversy. Recently, the state of New York prohibited the standing eight. Let's take a close-up look at the pros and cons of the standing eight count.
In the rush to institute safety measures, the WBC adopted the standing eight count. Almost immediately, the Boxing Society arose as one to object to this measure. The standing eight count is invoked when a fighter is judged to be in trouble or out on his feet and is scored as one point, not a two point as in a knockdown. Take the Arguello prior title fight last year. Alexis Arguello, taking a fearful beating from a fired up Aaron Pryor, just won't go down. The referee could have stepped in and given him a standing eight count, but what if he had? Would that have allowed Alexis to recover and maybe turn the fight around? Or might it have resulted in a longer and more fearful beating and possibly grievous injury to Alexis Arguello? Well, I think uh, for that particular fight would be bad because, uh, you know, I was really in a bad condition and, uh, you know, I think the, the referee did the right thing and it was a terrible moment. And I think uh, for me, for the referee, he did his good stuff. He stopped the fight in the right moment and it was a bless for me. Complete curse because it gives the guy a second chance around. If you give eight counts, it'd been, we would have had a loss in the Hearns fight. When you give a guy a standing eight count, you're just prolonging the misery. Uh, I think that if a guy's hurt, stop the fight. So standing eight count was invented for the amateur ranks, and it belongs in the amateur ranks. Uh, I think that the standing eight count only prolongs the punishment that a fighter may be taking, only to have him come back and receive more punishment. I think that a well-experienced referee who is well-skilled in his craft knows when he should stop a fight. Once you got a guy hurt, you should get him out of there because some guys got the tendency of coming back and you can lose behind it. But And then they got a tendency of coming back and taking more punishment. So I think that standing eight count is not a blessing. I think that's in the amateur rules and I think that should stay in the amateurs. The standing eight count is simply the wrong wrench for the right nut. Standing eight count was developed for amateur fighting where the object is not to hurt the other man, but to outpoint him. In professional fighting, the object is to stop your man as soon as possible. By giving a standing eight count, you could conceivably cause that which you're trying so hard to avoid, serious injury in boxing. So referee Tony Perez concurring with the views of the fight doctor on the subject of the standing eight. Moments ago, it was Larry Holmes successfully defending his heavyweight title, stopping Scott Frank at 128 of round five. Scott is alongside Ferdy. Let's get back to the ring. Scott, the thing that is on everybody's mind is the way you went down and held your eye. Were you thumbed? Uh, yeah, you know, I don't know if it was in purpose, probably an accident. But he has a habit when he throws open up the thumbs. It was a, you know, it was a good thumb. It was a good thumb to the eye. Uh, yeah. Now, when you went down, did you think they should have given you time for your eye to clear up? Do you think Tony Perez should have given you time? I, my own opinion, yes. But this is the way boxing is, and nothing I can say about it. He was a good ref in there. I can't say nothing bad. All right. You were trying. Your game plan, as you had told me, was to pass the time for about five rounds and open up in a street fighting kind of way. You think that was some kind of a mistake? Those first five rounds were blazing. Yeah, it, it, it was a fast pace. I could have picked it up, but, you know, when you make plans, you're supposed to stick by them. I was just going to... You know, Larry's a strong puncher, but he can't really hurt you. You know, he throws some nice combinations. And I hit him twice in a second. I knew I hurt him. So I said, let this guy get a little more tired, a little more confident. And once I had his confidence up, then I was going to bomb away. You know, it's a 12-round fight, so they, hey, take your time. All right, now the rap is going to be there's a tremendous difference in class between you and Larry Holmes. Do you feel that difference in class? There isn't. He's a boxer. I'm a brawler. I mean, you know. He, he's a good boxer, but, you know, a guy like him, you let him go for five rounds and throw a lot of punches, he gets tired. In all his fights, he gets tired. You know, and he wasn't in the greatest shape of his life today. And, I, hey, I knew I'd get him. I caught him in the second round a couple of right hands. I knew I hurt him, but I didn't want to go after him with right hands because then he would just go away, go away all night. So I want to get him confident again to sucker him in for right hands. I you know what? You should have tried to have out-talked him. You could have out-talked him in, in a minute. Yeah. You gave it your good shot. You have nothing to be embarrassed about. And uh, we throw back to Marv Albert at ringside. Thank you. All right, Ferdy, obviously the Scott Frank philosophy, he felt he had Larry Holmes right where he wanted him, that eventually he would have gotten tired of punching him. We'll be back here at Atlantic City, New Jersey in just a moment. Where 
earlier, it was Larry Holmes successfully defending his heavyweight championship against Scott Frank. 128 round five, the official time. Next for Larry Holmes, coming up in November, is Marvis Frazier, who is alongside the fight doctor. Marvis, you think it was wise of you to come here and take a look at that awesome exhibition of the champion, Larry Holmes? Well, I felt that uh, Mr. Holmes looked extremely good, you know. Uh, he's the champion of the world, and uh, he did as such. But uh, he's not going to be fighting Scott Strength on uh, November the 25th. He's going to be fighting Marvis Frazier. You fight three minutes of every round. I, every time I've seen you, you go just like this guy here, three minutes of every round, just like your old man Joe. You think that uh, Holmes can stand up to three minutes of every round pressure like you put on people? Well, I don't think so, but you know what they say, Chip don't fall far from the block. And here's the block, and he's getting to be a big sequoia all by himself. You're getting bigger with the uh, age. Well, uh, not really me. Bigger, fatter. Or... I, I ain't going to say fatter to you. Fatter. You're too tough. Oh, well, you beat I'm, too many of my fighters. I don't want to say nothing I'm to you. I'm getting better in whatever I do. You know what I mean? If you're just running out of the road and walk back. All right. Yeah. Now, Joe, you were always, always a full-action fighter. Your son's the same way. I imagine you train him the same way, and in the corner, you're the same way. Now, you got any kind of game plan for him to beat Holmes? I don't want any secrets now. Well, the game plans we're going to do at uh, Holmes, uh, Mr. Larry Holmes, a uh, great champion. We had the belt long enough. Uh, it's time for new ideas, young ideas now. Uh, I step down, all other champions step down. It's time for him to move. And from that, from the great Joe Frazier, one of the great heavyweight champions of our time, we go back to Marv Albert. All right, Ferdinand, we do have a busy boxing October and November coming up here on NBC. You know, these past few years, our boxing coverage on NBC has brought forth a number of uh, odd moments, both in and out of the ring. So our crack staff, spending many hours, has assembled the very best of the bazaar. some intriguing openings to our boxing programs. And all of a sudden, I came out with my sensational 1-5. You ever see my 1-5? 1-5, 1-5! 2-3 and 4, I got it. My wife and I go to a lovely restaurant twice a week. A little candlelight, a little wine. She goes Tuesdays, I go Friday. <laughs> so excited to be here today. These two guys are the two sexiest, best-looking, hottest numbers NBC has got. And I'm talking about Merv and Freddie. <laughs> Away from the ring, Mustafa Hampshire, now a restaurant entrepreneur showing his skills. Johnny Dancing Machine Carter pulling one out of the annals of Rocky. Fletcher's mother, who brought enthusiasm and mother love to new heights in decibel volume. The fight doctor meets his match, a colleague of his, a witch doctor from Uganda. Heavyweight Ronaldo Snipes has certainly had his ups and downs in the ring. Disappearing act. Mysteriously, Ted Sanders did not show up for his rematch with Alex Ramos, slipping out of town in the middle of the night. Back to Ronaldo Snipes, who found Jumbo Cummings to be a biting opponent. The Low Blow Festival, or why boxers retire early. In Tampa, Dwight Walker finds out if Frazee is wearing his protection. Wolfred Scipion, who was not pleased about the ring technique of Mustafa Hampshire. Hard Rock Green training for Bubble Shaughnessy. Unfortunately, he had to fight Animal Fletcher, and predictably, he lost. And Ferdy has had his share of low-key post-fight interviews. This calls for a rematch. We do that. Okay? Say something else. Look at Wait a minute. Look at time. time. All, right. All right. The best body in boxing belongs not to Ali, not 
not to Holmes, not to Sugar Ray, but to my broadcast partner, Marv Albert. When do you find time to work out with your busy schedule, Marv? Well, uh, Ferdy, you know, I haven't been working out as uh, feverishly recently. <laughs> That's an old photo. We'll be back to take another look at the fifth and final round of Larry Holmes and Scott Frank. You can never know. Comparing, I think that anyone would categorize what we saw tonight as a, a surprise, perhaps the way it ended, the fact that Scott Frank took the thumb of the eye, but most people will say what happened was inevitable. I think so. Uh, I, it probably um, had um, Holmes had the patience to wait till he got tired, as Scott Frank had planned. <laughs> he now goes into the Scott Ledoux Hall of Fame along with uh, Cobb, waiting for Holmes to get tired yes. while they were getting beaten to a uh, pittance. All right, let's take a look at what turned out to be the fifth and final round, and Larry Holmes had his way throughout, throwing the shutout. He opened very strong with that left jab. Scott Frank did get a couple of good right hands in the latter portion of the uh, second round, but uh, really not much. It was all Larry Holmes, and that's the fifth and final round. I think Larry anxious to prove, and especially with Marvis in the audience, uh, a little, uh, certainly an impressive performance that Marvis can go home and daydream about for a little while now. He goes out to prove that he can knock somebody out fast. He came out blazing. His uh, jab was very strong and authoritative, and the right hand followed. And there was nothing that Scott Frank could do to neutralize him. Of course, Scott Frank had his viewpoint, as we heard in his post-fight interview, but again, I think people will say, well, yes, Larry Holmes carried the extra weight. Yes, he had no real problem with Scott Frank, but what did tonight prove? Did it prove anything? He beat a club fighter. What he did tonight was have a tuna fight in the uh, tradition of all the heavyweight champions in the world. He tuned himself up. He's now feeling good about himself. He gets confidence in his punch. Now he goes back to serious training for Marvis Frazier, and I think we got a barn burner of a fight coming up. And that'll be in November, and there is the sequence. Scott Frank trying to inform the referee Tony Perez that he got the thumb in the left eye. His left eye was bothering him earlier. Perez could have given him the standing eight, did not. Gave it the mandatory eight. The fight continued. Frank covers up, and you'll see Perez come in and say, that's it. Here it is. All over. Well done by Perez. I don't, I don't think there was an argument there. If there was anything, Perez could have given him some time to recover from the thumb in the eye. Once again, we see the thumb in the eye, which should never be if we had thumbless gloves. Well, Not that it was a factor in this fight because the end was preordained from that first round on when we saw a new and different Larry Holmes intent on knocking out his opponent as soon as he could rather than play with him as he did with Witherspoon. So that was it, as uh, Tony Perez called it at 128 of round five. Scott Frank not pleased about the way it ended. He felt the fight could have continued, but of course that is his point of view. And certainly a night uh, uh, for a lot of work for the New Jersey Commission doctors, uh, as there were many cuts. Aquino suffered a perforated eardrum in his win over Steve Heron, who had to go to the hospital to get sewed up. Kirkland Lang had to go to the hospital to get checked up, although the doctors assure me that he was perfectly all right, and it's just a routine neurological checkup. So that we saw a lot of um, different lacerations and injuries in an evening fraught with upsets. The most serious could have been Kirkland Lang, who was stopped by a good-looking prospect out of Stockton, California, by the name of Fred Hutchings, who put Lang down in round 10, and Lang made heavy contact with his head on the canvas, but fortunately is all right. But in the main event, it was defending successfully for the 16th time in his career, Larry Holmes stopping Scott Frank in round number five. And I wonder if uh, Holmes will come in as heavy for Marvis Frazier in November. Want to make a bet that he doesn't even come close to being as heavy? You're going to see a slick Larry Holmes in November. Larry Holmes by TKO in round five. So this is Marv Albert along with the fight doctor, Ferdy Pacheco, saying thank you for tuning in.
after tomorrow at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, NFL 83 will start the day with a look at Baltimore's controversial coach, Frank Cush, and Denver's rookie sensation, John Elway. And then an NFL doubleheader featuring an interconference battle between the Green Bay Packers and the Pittsburgh Steelers. And at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, quarterback Jim Zorn and top rookie running back Kurt Warner taking on Richard Todd, Freeman McNeil, as the Seattle Seahawks visit the New York Jets at Shea Stadium. Check your local listings for the games and times in your area. Big day of football tomorrow here on NBC. Larry Holmes successfully defending his WBC heavyweight title, stopping Scott Frank in round five here in Atlantic City, New Jersey. So for Larry Holmes, in retaining that title, the dream continues.